Now I'm thrilled to continue with our 11th session uh, of the review, and this one on mergers and acquisitions. He introduced Whit Cobb. Uh, Whit is the general counsel of PAE. He provides legal advice to the company and oversees the company's legal staff. Uh, next, we have Susan Gabay. Susan is uh, the managing director in Houlihan Loki's aerospace defense and government practice. Catherine Hickey. Uh, Hickey is a partner in Palero Mazza. And last but not least, uh, Damien Speck is a partner in Morrison Forrester's government contracts and public procurement practices. Whit, uh, let me turn it over to you to get us started. Well, thanks very much, Alan. Uh, really appreciate your introducing us all. And uh, you know, we've got a, I think we've got a, a great panel, a number of uh, really outstanding topics, including uh, M&A trends for 2020. Um, we'll talk about some uh, protest issues, small business issues, uh, SPACs, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some predictions for 2021. Um, so to, to kick us off, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Susan Gabay to talk about what happened in the M&A area in, uh, in 2020. Sure. Thank you, Whit, and uh, thanks, Alan. I, um, it's, it's four o'clock and we're the last panel of the day, so I'm, I'm going to start with, um, for, all, for all you literary geeks, uh, a quote out of Charles Dickens, which I've been using to describe 2020, and that is, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and certainly when COVID hit, uh, across the government contracting sector in all sectors. Uh, it did feel like the worst of times, um, but, but this sector showed in 2020 a remarkable, uh, a remarkable amount of resilience, both in terms of uh, transaction valuations uh, as well as volume. Uh, in, in 2020, as we sit uh, at the end of the year and entering 2021, uh, the valuation environment uh, has remained at levels that we really haven't seen in the 20 plus years that I've been doing this. Uh, public companies are trading at uh, a median valuation multiple of 14 times EBITDA or thereabouts, uh, which is about where they were pre-COVID. Uh, transaction volume in 2020, notwithstanding the fact that even in government contracting M&A, things effectively shut down for 60, uh, in some cases 90 days after COVID hit. Uh, transaction volume last year was up about 12%. Uh, we saw north of 100 transactions in the GovCon, GovCon space. Uh, so despite uh, what, what many of us are seeing in other sectors of the economy, the government contracting space has returned to uh, some degree of normalcy and did rather quickly uh, after the March-April timeframe. Um, who, who's buying and what are they buying? Uh, we're seeing uh, virtually every category of strategic buyers and private equity groups interested in deals in the space. Uh, private equity has driven about 50% of the deal volume in the last year, which is pretty consistent with the level we've seen over the last two or three years. Again, consider, consider that metric in the context of a period of time between March and May last year when there effectively was no financing available. Um, and what are, what, are, what, are, what are buyers buying? There's a, there's a handful of key themes out there and private equity as well as strategics are chasing some of the, uh, the areas of the budget environment that are deemed to be better insulated from budget pressures that very well, well could emerge with a new administration uh, and, and a Senate that's split. Uh, when you look at the nine public companies in the space that we track, uh, and we're looking very closely at the, both the horizontal capabilities that they're identifying as investment priorities, as well as um, some domain areas of, of those nine public companies. Eight of them talk about cyber as a, as a key priority. Uh, six or seven of them focused on data analytics, AI, machine learning. Uh, four or five of them focused on next generation IT, digital transformation. And if you look at the private equity platforms in the space that are emerging and private equity over a long period of time, as many of you know, has had this uh, incredible role in terms of repopulating that middle market in the GovCon space, uh, their, their, uh, their platforms are generally mirroring uh, the appetites 
of the strategic buyers. They're trying to create that next crop of companies that will look like something the strategic buyers want to buy. Um, and so I, I, I talked about public company valuation multiples in the 14 time, times range. The median transa M&A transaction multiple in 2020 was in the 10 to 11 times range. Um, but for those assets, regardless of the scale of the asset uh, that matched up with some of the investment priorities that I mentioned, cyber analytics, uh, digital IT transformation, the median transaction multiples were in the 12 to 14 or 15 times range. So there's a universe of assets uh, that have been trading at a premium to even where the public companies are trading. Um, I, I think that private equity and, and many of us uh, that spend time doing deals and, and I'm sure Damien and Wit, Wit, who's been a partner to private equity on a couple different occasions can certainly speak to this. Private equity continues to be um, I think the most interesting story in the market in 2020 and expect it to continue to be an interesting part of the, the landscape in 2021. Uh, we, we've been tracking over uh, the last 20, 23 or 24 years, the volume of private equity investment activity in the defense and government services space. And in 2020, uh, for the first time, the sectors reached just about 90 platforms, 89 distinct platforms in the GovCon space, uh, which is a net increase of 15 new platforms from 2019. If you go back 20 plus years, the only period of time where we saw something even close close to that metric was in 20, 20, 2010 to 2011, when we saw a net, net new number of platforms of 11. And that was a period of time, as many of you can probably recall, um, where, the, where the budget climate and the valuation environment were much more challenging than it is today. So the one thing that I find most interesting and, and even astonishing is the fact that uh, sophisticated institutional investors notwithstanding the fact that the valuation environment is as strong as it's been, continue to deploy, continue to deploy capital in this space at very significant levels. So last year we saw uh, relatively few private equity exits, six exits, 21 new platforms, and about 31 add-on acquisitions to existing platforms, uh, which is an incredible, incredible volume of activity. Um, and and uh, probably the most interesting example, and we get asked many, many times, as you would imagine, since the election and the change of administration and the Senate dynamics being what they are, um, how, how that's likely to impact investors' perceptions of the space. And I think it's interesting if you look at one of the, one of the best bellwethers, Veritas Capital, who's been uh, one of the most successful and significant investors in the space over a very long period of time. Since, since the election, uh, they, they deployed uh, $3.5 billion in the purchase of the Northrop IT services business. And I just saw uh, a news announcement uh, across my desk about uh, their contemplated acquisition of Perspecta for $7 billion. That's 10, you know, 10 plus billion dollars of capital that Veritas is putting into the sector in a very short period of time following, um, fo following the election outcome and some dynamics that some could look at as potentially presenting some risk. Um, so it's, it's a very dynamic, uh, very dynamic environment. Um, and obviously I outlined a pretty bullish view of what's going on in the space and the level of activity and the valuations that are going along with uh, transactions. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, there have been some impacts that COVID has had on M&A. From an advisor perspective, uh, it's been relatively minimal. Um, buyers have been much more accustomed to buying businesses without, frankly, ever meeting uh, some of the management teams in person. Uh, we success successfully closed a transaction in October that was initiated post-COVID, uh, where the acquirer never met the management team of the business, which is astonishing for many of us uh, that have been doing this for a long time. And it's a very people-driven people, people -driven business. I think there are some benefits um, to, to buyers being more comfortable doing things virtually, whether it's management meetings or diligence sessions and so forth. 
Um, and I think buyers generally have shown that they're, they're willing to roll up their sleeves and do more work uh, on a remote basis earlier in a process than they might otherwise do, uh, which does put us as an advisor in a situation where perhaps earlier in, in, a long, in a typical process, you can identify the handful of bidders that are really likely uh, to be your best bidders who are investing time and energy um, earlier on in a process. Um, but I'll turn it over to, to Damien here uh, and I know we have some other, some other more diligence oriented topics that are COVID related um, uh, that, I, that I think it's worth noting. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I guess I'll second, uh, I'll second your point, um, which is you know, we saw a number of new private equity entrants into the market as well um, uh, last year, which would be a, a very strange year to choose to, uh, to enter the market. Um, and so it's been it's been an interesting and very busy um, busy last year, uh, despite COVID. Um, but when you have new entrants, um, they need to learn all sorts of new diligence issues. Um, and government contractors, like any other regulated industry, um, there are a number of sharp edges. Um, and uh, 2020 gave us uh, new sharp edges in PPP loans and uh, Section 3610 of the of the CARES Act. So we thought it was worth at least starting to touch on those issues and uh, how to understand them, uh, how to diligence them, how to get through them and to get deals done, because it is certainly the case that many, many businesses that took PPP loans and many businesses that build under 3610 have transacted um, in, in recent months. So as regards PPP loans, we all remember almost, uh, almost a year ago now uh, when the PPP regulations, it seems like every Friday night there was a new drop of regulations and guidance and everyone was trying to figure out not only the economic situation, but also the regulatory situation. Um, now those businesses have gotten their PPP loans, they've expended the funds, and in some cases they've submitted for forgiveness or they're beginning the process of uh, submitting for forgiveness. If you're a buyer looking at those businesses, what do you need to be on the lookout for? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the fact that these regulations were, were flying fast and furious, there were FAQs and, and interim rules. And so very important to make sure that company was eligible. Uh, a lot of these companies were analyzing affiliation for the first time ever. Um, and so you need to make sure that they were eligible for those loans, they were an actual small business. You need to look at the documentation that they submitted um, supporting the, the loan. Did they submit the right number of employees to get, to get the right amount? Um, there was also a lot of discussion in April and May of last year about necessity. Is the loan necessary? Um, and we had no clarity at the time as to what it was to be, to be necessary to the operations of the business and how someone could meet that test. Um, now we have a little bit more guidance. Um, there is, uh, there is a, the SBA Form 3509, which is a necessity questionnaire, which we actually use as part of our diligence process to think about whether or not the company properly documented uh, whether or not the loan was necessary. We also look for things like contemporaneous documentation from March and April and May before they submitted for their PPP loan to show if it was actually necessary to the business. Um, and board awareness, uh, you know, do, did the board review this? Did they make a determination um, as to whether or not the, the loan was necessary and whether or not to pursue it? And we look at all of those things to try to get our arms around the whether or not the loan was was properly granted in the right amount, whether they were eligible for it, et cetera. Um, but, but the other piece of PPP is that until that loan is repaid, uh, there are tricky consent rules. Early in the program, um, many of us applied sort of the legacy 7A SBA loan consent rules to PPP, but, but those are not the rules that apply now. Um, SBA has issued gu guidance clarifying exactly what the consent rules are for the recipient of a PPP loan to engage in a change of control transaction. And so I'll walk through those quickly here for those who've not read the circular. No consent is required if the transaction involves less than 20% of the equity of a concern or less than 50% of its assets, or if the loan's been finally paid off or finally forgiven, it's closed at this point. 
right? That's no consent. Um, and of course, that can be abridged or amended by the lender's own documents, which might require consent. Lender consent, as opposed to SBA consent, can be had for transactions um, that, are, that involve 50% or less of the stock of a concern, um, or 50% or more, so you can have a change of control transaction, but only if the forgiveness application has been submitted and the PPP loan amount has been submitted into escrow with the bank that issued the original loan. Um, and now I'm, I'm understanding that many banks are closing their forgiveness portals for right now while they're working on PPP draw two. So that may well cause issues because if you don't fit into one of those two buckets I previously discussed, you need SBA consent. And SBA consent uh, for the transaction, um, the SBA says that they'll issue you consent within 60 calendar days. So it can turn into a long poll for a transaction if you don't fit into one of the, one of the prior rules. The other uh, interesting new program around COVID that requires diligence is Section 3610 of the CARES Act. So this was set up to try to deal with uh, employees who need to be kept at a ready state, but could not actually go to the facilities in which they were working, couldn't go there full time, et cetera. And that's fine. Um, and many companies uh, uh, took this assistance, but the problem is that the guidance is all over the map. Um, this was sort of an opt-in program and agencies had to make decisions as to exactly how they were gonna implement the program. So when we diligence 3610, the very first place we start is do you have authorization from your customer to charge 3610 amounts? Do you have essentially the authorization to charge them for personnel who are not currently working? Had you charge them the right amounts? You're supposed to be charging them the minimum contracted amount um, and only for 40 hours per week. And how did you document it? Uh, the documentation requirements go to the person, the contract, the reason. Do you have all that documentation lined up? Uh, and then uh, during this process, um, OMB throw us a little bit of a curveball with PPP double dipping through 3610. Um, and whether or not you could, you could essentially take 3610 money and PPP. And I think the short answer of that is, that is guidance is all over the place. Very likely you can take both of them. However, you can't apply them to the same employees. And so I think that is a cost accounting issue that we're going to be seeing for the next couple of years as DCAA sort of grinds through um, all of these issues. So Whit, I wonder if you have a practical perspective on, on some of these issues from the general counsel's chair. Well, absolutely, when it comes to M&A, uh, valuations can be impacted due to any time that's being charged under 3610 because key thing to remember about 3610 time is that it doesn't uh, include profit or fee. So if you're doing an M&A transaction with a company that's got employees that are subject to 3610 paid leave, you've got to estimate um, how long, you know, the 3610 time is going to continue, you know, what's the profit impact of that. Um, this is especially an issue in the Intel community where employees generally, generally have to work um, on site in an office and can't, can't take work home. Do others have, uh, have comments on, uh, on COVID-19 and m &A? If not, we can, we can move on. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, uh, so I'll start this one as well. Um, this is protest developments impacting m and 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 I know that there has been a prior session on protests, um, but the fact is that m and lawyers get a bad rap for not hanging out after the deal is done to make sure that contracts stick around. Um, and, and these are some examples of how uh, those of us in the government contracts m and market can add value after a transaction and in fact should be providing guidance to our clients. Um, three interesting case studies um, that, that certainly are not unique, uh, but I think provide real practical guidance for uh, a market where we have hundreds of transactions every year and we need to, need to navigate them. So the, the first one is a DynCorp case, and I'm, I'm not going to go through the B numbers, et cetera. Those are all on your screen and in the slides. This is an interesting case. CACI Technologies, Inc. held an IDIQ contract. And like many firms, CACI, CACI Technologies, Inc. converted into an LLC. 
during the course of the IDIQ contract that it held. As I say, this happens all the times in transactions for tax reasons, et cetera. And CACI did the responsible thing. They submitted a change of name package. Well, that change of name package took more than two years to process. And so what ended up happening was that their system for award management entry had not been updated and they were submitting bids in the name of Inc. when in fact the corporate entity was an LLC. DynCorp noticed this, protested a task order and said, hey, CACI Technologies Inc. isn't even a thing anymore. It is now an LLC. It's a different offeror. They don't hold the IDIQ contract. They are not eligible for award. And the GAO said, no, uh, CACI is eligible. They did the right thing. Um, and it's interesting why the GAO said that. The GAO focused on the fact that the cage code had not changed for the entity. So CACI Technologies Inc. and LLC had the same cage code. Because they had the same cage code, there was no confusion over who the actual offeror was. Um, and GAO also said that it was reasonable for CACI to wait to update its SAM entry. Even though the Inc. didn't exist anymore, it was now LLC, it was okay that the system for award management entry was not, at, was not updated because the change of name package was pending. It was still working through the system. And I think the major takeaway here, uh, there's probably two. Number one, um, as many of us have thought, a conversion does not change the fundamental nature of an entity. Um, it's still the same entity under state law as it was before. But maybe the, maybe the more important takeaway is the GAO's focus on the cage code um, and, and identifying that cage code. And I will say that in my practice, when we have these circumstances, we generally uh, have the client drop a footnote to explain on the very first page of the proposal that they're bidding in the name of Inc. They are now LLC um, and make sure you draw a straight line. So I think that's one practical takeaway there. Second case I want to talk about is Night Point Systems. And this is a circumstance that comes up just about constantly. Um, so Knight Point is an acquired subsidiary of Perspecta. And in submitting their proposal, Knight Point referred to themselves as, um, as a Knight Point Systems LLC, a Perspecta company, and said that they were submitting this proposal through the bidding entity, Knight Point Systems LLC. But then they defined Knight Point Systems LLC as Perspecta, for purposes of the proposal, trying to benefit from Perspecta's excellent name and past performance and references and resources in, in the proposal. And importantly, just like in the CACI case and the CACI case, uh, the DUNS number and the CAGE code in this proposal were specific to Knight Point. They were not Perspecta. So this was a Coast Guard procurement and the Coast Guard uh, eliminated Knight Point from the competition, saying that Perspecta Inc. was the bidder and not Knight Point Systems, and therefore it was ineligible for award. The GAO disagreed. The GAO said, no, the cage code was there, the language was there explaining to you that this was being submitted by Knight Point, System, Knight Point Systems and not by Perspecta, but they were part of a larger organization. They were part of Perspecta and they could talk about that. Um, and so I think the important part here is that the business development function of every contractor wants to use all the affiliate uh, reputation, past performance, and branding that it possibly can. But it's important to be really clear as to who the offeror is, make sure the DUNS and CAGE line up. And if you're going to define the, the name of the contractor, make sure that things like past performance references, et cetera, tie back to specific entities and don't get swept up um, in the overall brand name. Think about the legal entity, not the, not the branding. Last one I'll touch on on the, on the protest front is Navarro Research. And this is an interesting case where a subcontractor and teaming partner was divested um, in the middle of the transaction. And so what impact does that have on the procurement? Um, and to save some time, maybe I'll do a short version of this one, which is essentially that Navarro um, protested this award. And what happened was the awardee had said in this proposal, we anticipate that this transaction is going to occur and our subcontractor is going to be divested, but we don't think it'll have any impact on contract performance.
So they were upfront about it. They said they don't think it'll have any impact on, on contract performance. So when Navarro protested both the GAO and the Court of Federal Claims, it argued, well, there was this divestiture and the agency had to consider it and it fundamentally changed the proposal because this is a, an entity that um, is no longer the same entity as it was when it was proposed to be a, to be a subcontractor. And the court disagreed. Um, but, but the reasoning why the court disagreed is particularly important. It was because the agency had documented, um, had accepted a declaration from that uh, subcontractor and had documented why it thought this did not change the nature of the proposal. And so I think what this emphasizes is it pays to be upfront with your customer, help them document the record, and that provides a defensible protest, even if your subcontractors get sold out from under you. Um, so I don't know, Whit, do you have any thoughts on any of those cases? Well, I, I do actually. I thought on um, the Navarro case, uh, it, it possibly undercuts some prior GAO decisions that, that invalidate awards uh, where there's a corporate sale between the proposal and the, the time of award. And um, I, just, I just wondered what your thoughts on that, given that this is at, coming out of the, the Court of Federal Claims. Yeah, I think it really turns on the agency's documentation and the ability that the agency has to, uh, uh, to reasonably evaluate the facts that are in front of it. Um, and and there's probably a bit of a distinction between a subcontractor that's going to have a divisible piece of work and a prime contractor who the government's going to enter into the enter into the, the agreement with. Unless others have have thoughts on protests, uh, we can we can advance to the next slide. And, and Catherine, would you like to take over? Yes, thank you very much, Damian. Um, okay, so we're going to shift now to talk um, a little bit about uh, reps and warranties insurance in the context uh, of what we've seen in 2020, um, new trends that we've seen by way of, uh, you know, the prevalence of these policies in M&A transactions, as well as um, certain exclusions that we've seen uh, pop up. Um, in large part as a result of uh, the, the specific 2020 difficulties around uh, COVID-19, um, CARES Act, as well as you know, general trends in, in cybersecurity. Um, so the, in kind of tracking the deal market over the course of 2020, there was a dip um, mid-year in uh, the number of uh, new reps and warranties policies bound um, probably hit a low point around April um, and, and then, but tracked an upward trend in deal flow over the course of the end of the year and um, continuing up uh, through the end of uh, Q4 um, in 2020. Uh, we've seen a, an expansion of interest in reps and warranties policies um, going further down in the market uh, and continuing a trend in that direction that has been ongoing for a few years now. Um, I think that the, the, the lowest dollar value deals that, that tend to be able to support a reps and warranties policy still tends to be hovering around um, you know, the $30 million range at the very low point. But you know, we've, we've seen deals uh, in late 2020 um, where the parties at least explored the, the possibility and the availability of reps and warranties coverage um, for transaction values as low as um, 22 million in one case. You know, ultimately, uh, in just anecdotally, in those instances, we we saw parties um, decide that, that it wasn't going to be um, cost effective to go that route after pricing out the policies. But I think there is still that general trend of interest, and uh, even in those um, lower market deals, we are seeing uh, more and more of um, you know, sellers especially pushing to at least consider, uh, get some quotes and see whether a policy can be, can be justified. Um, so I would anticipate, you know, and, and perhaps when, when we get to the end and we talk about projections for 2021, I would anticipate to see that trend continue uh, consistent with um, kind of over the past uh, three years or so, just a, a general expansion 
um, of the these policies and M&A activity, especially as more and more insurers um, come onto the market and make the policies generally more affordable. Um, in 2020, specifically, some some new exclusions popped up that have become quite common in policies that we're seeing issued um, in transactions uh, currently. Um, you know, starting with, and this is not specific to 2020, although there were certainly some events of 2020 that in, increased um, the focus on cybersecurity issues and how those would factor into uh, policy exclusions. Um, very often uh, we will see that a policy would, will specifically exclude uh, coverage for issues relating to breach, data breaches, um, system security breaches, uh, typically uh, unless there is a cyber policy in place that would provide um, some support coverage there. Um, you know, with the solar winds uh, massive breach that I, I think um, kind of shook uh, the the market in general um, and has had noticeable impact on the M and A market as well. Uh, not that data privacy and security issues weren't previously a high focus of diligence and uh, risk allocation, um, but you know, speaking as someone who has been in the midst of a transaction that started prior to Solar Winds uh, and it, it, it is still ongoing. Um, with respect to a target company that was directly impacted by that breach, um, it's it's definitely resulting in you know highly highly focused diligence around that issue. Uh, uh, if there is a reps and warranties policy in the mix, it's going to be a large focus of underwriting, um, and it, it is likely going to result in some exclusions for those issues uh, from the coverage. Um, again, sometimes narrowed by cyber policies that, that may be in existence. Um, with respect to 2020 COVID-19 specific issues, uh, when the target company has a PPP loan um, and, and that's part of the deal, I think you can expect to see that carved out in some way uh, from the coverage as well. And again, this all shifts back to uh, you know, the issues that relate to uncertainty around what is going to be sufficient for the determination of necessity, um, the use of the funds, uh, and you know, even just basic calculation of eligibility and determination of eligibility based on other factors such as, for example, size um, or some of the other exclusions from um, borrower eligibility under the, the 7A loan programs. So we've seen fairly broad exclusions of pretty much anything relating to uh, a PPP loan, um, certifications that were made in connection with acquiring the loan, uh, and you know any other liability that could potentially result uh, as as a result of the process of getting the loan or its the application for forgiveness um, or any certifications made in connection with that process. Um, and you know that that's likely to continue because again the the theoretically even after loan forgiveness where perhaps it becomes less of an issue you know there is an ongoing audit period with respect to those issues that that could create lingering issues here and so i don't think that we're going to be especially with the ppp2 now getting in full swing I think that is going to continue to be a focus, um, both of diligence and then obviously of, of these policy coverage exclusions um, for, for some time for the foreseeable future. Another bullet point that is not addressed on this slide, but that we've also seen in policy exclusions is uh, general carve outs related to COVID-19 issues. Um, earlier in 2020, we saw them start out relatively broadly. Um, we saw some policies that essentially excluded coverage for any, any liability relating to uh, issues arising out of the COVID-19 pandemic. I, I think as, um, as the market generally got a better sense of exactly where those risk factors uh, were likely to arise, we've seen those exclusions narrow. 
um, and in some cases be more specifically tailored to the business of the target. So the most common ones that we're seeing now are, you know, rather than general COVID-19 related exclusions, it would be exclusions related to, um, you know, for example, uh, claims from employees that the employer failed to protect them uh, from, you know, take sufficient measures to protect them from COVID-19. Um, or similarly, there might be exclusions uh, for um, interruptions to supply chain or inability to provide services as a result of COVID-19. Um, so again, uh, those are all likely to continue. And, and as, uh, as the pandemic shifts and has differing impacts on the market, we may see slight shifts in those exclusions as well. Um, so I, I, Susan, did you have anything else that you wanted to add uh, with respect to reps and warranties insurance uh, before we move on? Yeah, the, the only two things I would add are, are yes, we, we have been using rep and warranty insurance on every transaction. I can't think of a transaction in the last several years where we haven't used rep and warranty insurance. Uh, and I will say just, uh, you know, last year in 2019, it, it sort of felt like S, S Corp issues were the issues du jour. Every, every company that I had been selling that was a privately held business that was an S Corp seemed to have some issue, real or perceived. Um, and in, in 2020, it seemed like almost every transaction has had some sort of cyber issue in the defense space. This is uh, a very uh, real-time issue where, um, particularly for those companies that are focused on developing national defense assets, uh, it's become a huge issue. And so the trending that you referenced around uh, policy exclusions and so forth, I think will, will be... Um, particularly interesting to monitor as, uh, as that evolves as we move forward. Thank you. And yes, just, just to chime in and pile on with respect to the S Corp exclusions, um, because I find that that tends to be particularly of issue um, in government contracting M&A transactions, because it just there seems to be a high prevalence of S corporations among the government contracting community. And, um, I don't know that I've ever met a perfectly clean S corp, and so that is is obviously um, always going to be an area of particular focus and likely an exclusion from the policy to the extent there is there are concerns that arise in diligence around um, the validity of the election. And something we've also seen, just to highlight another trend, is is the rise in tax insurance um, as a, a double layer of protection there when you do have um, not just S Corp, but any other specifically identified tax issues, um, we'll often see parties uh, seek some additional coverage to back up those exclusions with a, a tax policy as well. Yeah, we've seen that too, Catherine. Um, I think I had one or two transactions last year where the buyer or seller purchased a separate tax policy for S corp related issues. So uh, I was surprised that uh, some of the issues were insurable, but uh, it's worth asking. It is worth asking um, to, for those who might be listening, who um, haven't looked into it. Uh, I similarly was, was somewhat surprised by the affordability of those policies, uh, depending on the issues at hand. Um, but it's certainly something to keep in mind if those issues rear their heads. Um, I think that that's it for this slide if we wanna move on to the next one. Okay, now we're gonna talk a bit about recent regulatory developments that impact um, small businesses, specifically in the context of M&A. Um, as many are probably aware, uh, a new rulemaking um, was issued in late 2020 uh, that came out with some pretty broad updates um, to uh, SBA uh, programs, including mentor-protege programs, joint ventures, uh, various small business set-asides. Um, and we don't need to go into all of those changes, um, but we will focus specifically on the ones that, that are going to impact um, M&A activity in buyers and sellers. Um, the first one uh, has to do with recertification, mandatory recertification in the context of uh, change in ownership. Um, so prior to uh, this rulemaking, there was a little bit of a back and forth history um, with how the SBA viewed 
recertification in the context of uh, a change in ownership, would, which you know would typically occur as a result of an, an equity acquisition. Um, up until this rulemaking, the the general practice and understanding, uh, based upon some uh, some prior OHA case cases, was that upon acquisition, if a business had received a set aside based on its status as a small business and could no longer certify as small following the transaction, uh, the that you could, with, specifically with respect to multiple award vehicles, which is where this really comes into play, that the party could continue to be eligible for awards on that contract, even if uh, it could no longer recertify, it would, it would primarily mean that the agency could no longer take credit for, um, you know, the, the specific status uh, associated with, with the award. Um, previously, it, actually dating back to 2018, the SBA tried to, to correct that and, and eliminate this, um, but it was done in, uh, without the rulemaking process through what the SBA tried to characterize at the time as a technical correction to essentially say, no, um, if, if a business can no longer recertify uh, as small as a result of one of these mandatory recertification uh, triggering events, um, then it changes the firm status for future awards. So if you have a, an option, if you have a, a new task order, that, a new opportunity that you're bidding, you would not be eligible. Um, now, that had not typically been the practice because of the way that the SBA tried to address this. And so in this current rulemaking, they put it through the formal process and they have, um, you know, essentially formalized the requirement that following a, an acquisition, if a, if a concern can no longer recertify as small, that um, it will not be eligible to bid on uh, new opportunities under existing multiple award contracts. And this is going to have a significant impact um, for sellers that are, you know, may previously have relied upon opportunity value with respect to those contract vehicles. If you're selling to a large business, um, if you're, you know, if you're selling to a private equity backed company, um, this is going to impact valuation. Uh, and, you know, we're already seeing that play out um, for some of our companies where this is, um, you know, a large portion of their pipeline value. Um, Another recertification issue that comes up in the new regulations uh, has to do with uh, what happens to a pending bid um, by a company that is perhaps in the M&A process. Uh, the, the new rulemaking um, states that if there is an acquisition transaction that occurs within 180 days of the date that an offer has been submitted, but prior to award. So you have a bid pending. Um, if a deal closes uh, with respect to the offeror within 180 days, the company is not eligible to receive the award. Um, so there's essentially this, this window of time where any pending bids are uh, compromised. Um, and are going to be impacted by, you know, the, the a transaction essentially taken um, out of out of the running. Uh, this is really creating issues for for our clients in the M and A market. Um, obviously, bids are being submitted all the time. Uh, what this ultimately results in is, you know, there's a, a moving target of, you know, with for any 180 day period. Um, if the award isn't made prior to a uh, transaction closing, then that is going to come off of the um, off of the asset list. And so this, depending on what might be out there and, and what opportunities are pending, that can have a, a significant impact um, to the transaction value. It, for bids that have been submitted greater than 180 days prior to closing, um, if the offeror is unable to recertify as small, they won't be eligible to receive the award, um, or I'm sorry, they will still be eligible to receive the award, but the, uh, the agency cannot take credit for, um, for the set aside. So the 180 day window is really, and I'm sorry, I don't believe, I may have missed 
the point that this is with respect to a company that's no longer going to be to be able to recertify post acquisition. So the award, if when the offer was made, the bidder was a small business, represented itself as a small business, post acquisition is no longer able to recertify a small, that's what takes away the eligibility for receipt of the award within 180 days. Um, so it's that change in status and, and the, the recertification that, that really creates the issue here. So again, buyers and sellers are going to really need to be focused on pending bids, uh, what's outstanding, and how that might impact, um, you know, potentially timing of closing. Uh, you know, I, I foresee that there may be, if there's a particularly lucrative um, opportunity that has not yet, where the award has not yet come out, we could see delayed closings potentially um, it, 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 in order to you know, verify whether or not that award is going to be made. I think we'll have to see how that plays out, but parties are definitely scrambling to try and figure out ways to navigate these new restrictions. Um, some other uh, points, that's really the main, from my perspective, um, M&A related change in the rules. Um, there are some changes to the, the mentor protege rules that impact, um, you know, the ability of uh, it kind of tightens the requirements with respect to um, mentor protege relationships, provides a little bit more uh, accountability for what the mentors are supposed to be providing, um, essentially giving the protege a, a requirement to provide reviews of the mentor's performance. Um, and it gives the SBA the ability to step in and actually terminate those relationships um, if there is, you know, poor performance uh, uh, by the mentor. Um, the the rulemaking. It, sorry, did did you want to say something, Dean? Oh, hey, hey, Catherine. I just wanted to be uh, be conscious of the time. We've only got about uh, ten minutes left, and one more slide. So, just wanted to to just to note that. Yeah, I appreciate that. We can. I'll just spin through really quickly. Thank you for the reminder. Um, a couple of these last points. Uh, the other, so the other point in the SBA regulatory changes to keep in mind um, with respect to uh, M and A activity is there were some changes to um, requirements under the 8A program to get SBA consent for changes in ownership that are actually quite helpful. To the extent that changes in owner, like previously, any change in ownership of an 8A company required SBA approval. Um, is pretty onerous process. Um, now they've changed it so that if the ownership change results in the qualifying individual increasing their ownership stake, you don't need approval. And if it's a change in ownership um, by an existing partner um, who uh, held 20%, uh, less than 20% of the business, both before and after the change, you don't need SBA approval. So those kind of incremental changes um, don't need to go through that whole process. And then finally, uh, another rulemaking uh, point to come up that was issued with respect specifically to the SBIR and STTR program. Um, there was some protest activity in 2019 uh, that resulted in um, the denial of eligibility for a phase three opportunity to a company that was the successor in interest to certain contract assets associated with prior phase one and phase two work done under SBI pro SBIR program. But because those specific um, phase one and phase two contracts had not been novated to the successor in interest, um, Ultimately, uh, it was it was held um, as a result of, of the protest of the phase three award that they were not eligible to receive the phase three award um, it, based on a reading of the rule that essentially held that unless those contracts were specifically novated, um, they could not be deemed to be a successor in interest. So the SBA went back and changed it. They said that's not the intent. Novation is not the only way that you can be a successor in interest. In my opinion, the rulemaking change is um, somewhat vague. So what they've done is say, inst instead of saying must be novated, that it may be novated or otherwise be a successor in interest to those phase one and phase two awards to create phase three eligibility for the successor. It remains to be seen, I think, what that means and what will be held to create um, actual successor and in interest opportunities. Um, Damien, I don't know if you have anything else to add there because uh, you should probably be the one speaking on this and not and not me. Um, so feel free to chime in or if we need to move on, um, you know, we can do so. But 
if you have two cents. I, I guess I'll just say that I agree with you that the rulemaking is is uh, probably too cute by half and not clear what it does. So, mm -hmm. um, and with that, we can move on. Okay. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about special purpose acquisition company. So what is a SPAC? This is a shell corporation that uh, raises cash through an initial public offering with the intent of acquiring an ongoing private business that will be identified after the IPO. Uh, because of this feature, SPACs are sometimes called blank check companies. Uh, if a SPAC can't find an acquisition within two years, uh, the shareholders will receive their initial investment back with an additional interest component. Once a SPAC signs an acquisition agreement with a private company, the next steps are called the de-SPAC process. Uh, and this requires coordination and cooperation between the SPAC and the private company being acquired. A couple of features of the DSPAC process include typically raising additional funds through a, uh, a private investment in public equity. This is done often via a roadshow. Uh, there will be a proxy and a shareholder vote. And then assuming the shareholders approve, the transaction closes and the acquired company becomes public, usually as a subsidiary of the initial SPAC legal entity, which is then uh, renamed. Um, as shown on the, the, by the chart on the right side, uh, SPAC popularity really took off in 2020. There were approximately 250 SPAC IPOs, uh, raising over $83 billion. And uh, in 2020, the SPAC IPOs raised collectively all prior years combined of SPAC IPOs, uh, were raised, out raised more than all the prior years. Um, and they accounted for half, half the IPO market in 2020. Um, closings or despackings were also strong in 2020 with $89 billion of enterprise value closed. And there was over 99 billion uh, pending at the end of the year. Um, we did have a major uh, despack transaction in our, in our industry sector. My company, PAE, uh, was bought by Gores Holdings 3. And Gores is a serial uh, SPAC creator. They previously took Hostess, uh, the maker of Twinkies, public. Um, there's also a new uh, aerospace and defense-focused SPAC called Pine Island Acquisition. And it's formed by a number of experienced uh, uh, financiers and former government officials. In fact, Secretary of Defense Austin was an advisor to the SPAC when it launched, but of course, he's since resigned. Um, Impact on the a and market. I think that uh, SPACs create uh, many additional opportunities for sellers and a whole new category of buyers. So I think they're gonna drive more, more M&A in our market. Um, they've got a number of advantages, especially to sellers, including um, going public more quickly. You're talking you know, three to six months versus over a year. You can go public during periods of instability. And we saw this in spades in, in 2020. Uh, and then you can also structure the transaction, including via things like cash outs to existing owners or earnouts that you can't really do in an IPO. Wanted to touch on the legal implications uh, of a government contractor being acquired by a SPAC. First thing to understand is that a uh, SPAC transaction is much more complex than a standard M&A transaction. Um, this is because the regular M&A process is overlaid with both you know, public company requirements and also legal, legal features that are unique to SPACs. Uh, the transactional agreement will contain a number of special provisions that address the despacking process, including the filing of a proxy statement and the pipe raise. Um, due diligence has a somewhat different dynamic because the SPAC itself has to you know, first conduct its own due diligence to make sure that the company is, is solid and worth buying. Then it has to resell the the target company to investors after signing the agreement and before closing. So there's, you know, in that sense, some alignment between the seller and the SPAC. Uh, reps and warranties may not survive closing, which limits the tail of exposure for both the acquired company and the SPAC. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's a major impact on the government contract aspects of m and uh, as long as there is no asset purchase of an entity that's performing government contracts, there's no Innovation requirement. Of course, if a SPAC has significant 
foreign ownership or sponsorship. There could be CFIUS or industrial security issues. Last point, I'll note that the SEC has, has renewed its focus on SPACs. It just issued some disclosure guidance at the end of last year that focuses on you know, conflicts of interest that the SPAC management team or sponsor might have. Uh, it notes that because of SPAC's time limit, the two-year time limit for entering into a transaction, that creates unique dynamics that might you know, lead the SPAC to enter into a transaction that maybe isn't in the best interest of shareholders. So the SEC is really focused on SPACs, and I think will continue to be so going forward. Um, uh, just to wrap up this slide, I think that you know, SPACs have clearly taken off. They're now a, a firm part of the M&A horizon. And while they create a certain amount of legal complexity, I think we're going to see more and more uh, SPACs in our industry going forward. Um, I know we're running short of time, so I will turn the mic over to Susan to, uh, to close us out. Next slide, please. Thanks, Whit. And I will be uh, short and sweet on this last slide. Um, a couple of things that we're keeping an eye on. I'll start with buyer universe and M&A posture, really no change. We think that buyers are maintaining a very aggressive acquisition post posture and will continue to do so. Um, working backwards, new administration priorities, too soon to tell. There's lots of, uh, lots of people talking about what might happen. I don't think anybody has a really good roadmap or thought about what, what, is going, what, what the budget will look like one or two fiscal years out. Um, and, and tax policy is uh, probably the most pertinent, pertinent issue du jour around some of the most near-term things driving activity. I think there's generally some consensus building that uh, the immediate focus of Congress will be to rescind the Trump tax cuts, which impacts uh, uh, what gets, what, how ordinary income gets taxed, uh, ho hopefully. And uh, uh, we certainly expect that uh, any more draconian changes to capital gains, uh, uh, likely not to happen in 2021, but nonetheless, I think sellers are making some decisions based on an expectation that some of those change will changes will inevitably happen. So with that, uh, I'll turn it, turn it back over to whomever wants to close this out, uh, Alan, and appreciate everybody listening and hanging in there. Susan, thank you. And uh, with Susan, Catherine, Damien, thank you very much for outstanding panel. We had high expectations and you didn't disappoint at all. So thanks for squeezing an awful lot of information into a very short period of time.